All right, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you uh, coming over today uh, after adjournment. Whenever we start committee meetings upon the adjournment of the House after we're done voting, it takes a little while for folks to get over. People have different committees. I myself had to go make quorum for the code revision committee uh, before coming over. So, but I thank you for being here. Um, today, there are about uh, two different measures uh, that I want to, really three, that I want us to chat about. Um, they center around the same subject matter, which is House Bill 493, which you have in front of you. And that is, um, should the State Board of Elections or the Secretary of State's office have some ability to um, uh, have uh, some semblance of measures to take when one of our local boards of elections, counties, consistently has trouble with their administration of elections. Um, some of you are familiar with this concept in, a, in another area. Uh, as, as many of you know that have been involved in this body in Georgia, if we have a school board, uh, which has reoccurring problems and begins to get in so much trouble that they're, in instances I've heard of, close to losing their accreditation. Uh, I had one county over near my area in, in the Augusta uh, area. They got in such bad shape um, that they were about to lose their accreditation. Uh, the kids that graduated from high school would not have been able to use their diplomas to get into college. Uh, because the school system was going to lose its accreditation. And there is a method in our law whereby the governor can step in through a series of hearings and findings and uh, basically uh, step into the place of the school board if necessary, get the school system back on track, and then turn it back over to the local elected officials. I know that's happened in the metro area in the past, and it's also happened, as I mentioned, in my area and other places. So. In parallel to that, what do we as a state do? What is our responsibility when and if we have a county that has consistent reoccurrences of problems with their election system, year in and year out? Should there be any mechanism similar to the one I just described, whereby somebody at the state level can step in uh, and help get that um, system back on track? What you have in front of you today is about three things, at least. Um, one is House Bill 493 um, by uh, Chairman Shaw Blackman uh, that is one method of beginning to address this issue. Uh, the other that you have in front of you in the form of a substitute for House Bill 493, and I'll just give you that LC number, LC 470907S is actually some language that was suggested to Chairman Blackman from the Association of County Commissioners in order to how to deal with such a problem as I described. And then there has been a bill that has even, a, I think, a, a third um, idea of how to address uh, low performing boards of elections and their ability to run elections that passed out of the Senate already. It is in the House. We won't be having a formal hearing on it today, but it's Senate Bill 89 by Senator Butch Miller, President Pro Tem of the Senate. Um, and it has another method to attempt to deal with these issues. So what I'd like to do, I know Chairman Blackman is coming over like uh, some of us, he was detained with another matter. I believe that Senator Butch Miller is gonna try to stop him with us too and talk about his bill. But what I'd like to do is look at the substitute um, to House Bill 493, which simply contains language suggested to us as a possible alternative by the Association of County Commissioners. Uh, and um, I believe Clint Mueller, the legislative director for the Association of County Commissioners is on with us via Zoom. Um, before we go to uh, Mr. Mueller to allow him to talk about uh, the substitute to House Bill 493, which is again, LC 470907S. Are there any questions or thoughts from any members of the committee on this subject or do you understand um, what the what the chair wants us to have a little discussion about today. Representative Burnow. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make a correction. Um, I am from Clayton County and Clayton County did lose their accreditation. However, our children were able to graduate and they were accepted into college. Our superintendent at that time secured another accreditation firm. And um, so our children, they even got the uh, Gates scholarship. So they can graduate and they can go to college. Thank you. Yeah, and I think over in my area, it was a different county and uh, they too were able to avoid losing their accreditation um, um, after the governor stepped in and, and helped the system get back on track. Um, the, um, and I didn't mean representative to imply that, uh, that, I don't think I called any counties names, I intentionally did not, um, other than the metro area, that they did lose their accreditation, but I know that there was some problems. Um, so. Any other thoughts or comments before we get started from any members of the committee? If not, Mr. Mueller, can you hear us? I can, can y'all hear me? Yeah, we see you too. Great. Well, uh, we appreciate you uh, joining us today. Uh, if you would, um, were you able to hear my opening comments? Yes. If you would, um, introduce yourself, tell us who you are and, and who you're with. And then if you would talk about the language uh, that uh, ACCG has worked on regarding this matter which is in front of us and something uh, we refer to as a substitute for House Bill 493. Good to have you. Thank you, Chairman Fleming. Thank you, members of the committee. We appreciate you having ACCG's input on this. As you all can imagine, the county commissioners that are ultimately in charge of paying for these elections uh, would like to retain some control and some oversight if there's a problem with the elections office. And as you also know, we do have elections boards in most of our counties. In some counties, we do have a probate judge that's serving as the overseer of our local elections. So our proposal that's before you is really modified after another area of county government in which we have boards of assessors that oversee the valuation of property. And as you may be familiar, our boards of assessors, once they're appointed by the county commission, they can't be removed without cause. And so uh, unless there's a problem, they stay there for their, for their term of their appointment. So there's that separation politically between the boards of assessors and the county commission. However, we have made changes to state law uh, as recently as about four or five years ago which does give a, an ability for a board of commissioners to intervene if a board of assessors is not doing their job. And the, and the way that works is if the board of assessors is, is, is not uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing, then we can call the Department of Revenue and have the Department of Revenue come in and do a performance review board. And then based on the outcome of that performance review, we can take that to a superior court judge and we can actually have the board of assessors removed if we need to. So just want to give you a little bit of background. This is not sort of a new concept we came up with. We're really modeling this after sort of an existing concept that it's already in law as far as how we deal with boards of assessors that are not uh, doing their job or following the law. So with that, I'll just quickly go through our proposal. And if y'all have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Uh, so what our proposal does is it would authorize either the county commission or in the case of city elections, the city council, or the state uh, board of elections to call for this performance review board. So again, we're giving, if, if the county commission, the city council don't wanna call for it, but the state wants to call for it, they have the right to call for this performance review. Um, the performance review will be conducted by a three person board. And this can be appointed by the secretary of state, or if y'all choose, it could be appointed by the state um, elections board, which, whichever um, you all want to do is fine with us. Uh, but the performance review board will be made up of two local election officials from other counties. So outside of the, of the county where the, uh, the board's work is in question and an employee of the elections division of the secretary of state. And so those three members will go in, they will conduct a review. We imagine that the election, local election officials from other counties will be seasoned veteran election officials that obviously um, work in well-run counties. They'll go in and they'll do an assessment and they have to submit a um, written report after their investigation of their findings. Um, the perform performance review board's findings may be grounds for remo removal but if the report recommends removal, so if they actually go so far as to say we recommend removal, then the local um, election official, which would be in case of many counties, your board of elections uh, would be suspended 
Um, now, if it's a probate judge, those are constitutional officers, and that's a little bit trickier situation. We can't just remove or suspend uh, probate judges since they're constitutional officers, so there may, may need to be additional thought put into how we deal with a probate judge in this situation. But once they're suspended, the local governing authority then would appoint a qualified person to temporarily fill that vacancy. And then the suspended election officials uh, would, would be required to uh, attend a hearing before a Superior Court judge. So again, you've got um, an outside independent judge. It's not beholden in any way to the county commissioner or the city council that would be hearing from the, the, the performance review uh, panel and then making a final determination if that, um, if that local elections board should indeed uh, be removed. And then if they are removed, so if the judge recommends removal, uh, then the uh, county commissioner and city council would appoint a successor to fill out the uh, remaining unexpired term. So that's, that's what we've come up with. Uh, again, we appreciate your input. We, we're trying to balance the need for outside intervention when a elections office is not performing like it should be with the need for local control to give our local county commissions and city councils the right to, to rectify the situation themselves, but also uh, to have state involvement and then also to get a, the court's involvement in this process. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions the committee has, Mr. Chairman. So I was trying to look over, uh, Clint, the, uh, the document that you had and listen to you at the same time. And sometimes I don't chew gum and walk well at the same time, but so you, you modeled it after something that you're currently doing with the Board of Assessors when there are problems there? Yes, it's closely modeled. Mod uh, we closely modeled it after that. There are some exceptions there. Obviously, uh, in this case, we allow the Secretary of State's office or the Board of Elections to have the right to call a performance review. In the case of our Board of Assessors, it's typically just the Board of Commissioners calling for the Department of Revenue to initiate the review. But other than that, most everything else works very similar to how we would deal with a board of assessors that was not following the law or doing their job. Chairwoman Smith. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, an assumption can be made when this situation shows up. Um, how quickly can this process work? I mean, it's, are we talking three months? Are we talking two weeks? Um, what What's the time frame that's logical for this? So we did not put any time frames in the, the model draft. That may be something the committee wants to consider. I will tell you with the, the Board of Assessors, typically they come in uh, and they can impanel a, a review performance review panel pretty quickly uh, as far as how long it takes to do their work. I guess that just depends on uh, you know, how many issues are they looking into? It's really hard to say depending on the complexity of the office and what they're, what are, how many issues they have to look into. But again, if you all want to put some time frames on that, you certainly could do that. Um, I would hope that they would be able to do this within, you know, a month or two. Um, so hopefully in short order um, before obviously a next election could occur. Question, Mr. Chair? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm trying to gauge how expedient it would be for this process to take. And if we had a runoff election and this, it was discovered during the general election, the first one, the primary general, and it needs to be addressed quickly, how do we do that? I think that's a fair question. And uh, I think part of the process that I had envisioned is not, um, uh, not something that happened just once, I guess, but something that was continuing over time. Um, um, that's a good question though. Uh, I think right now, um, if something happened in one election and it was attributable maybe just to the superintendent, I think the boards of elections probably have some ability to step in. Um, but if it was a continuing problem over time with uh, an election superintendent and the board of elections did not step in, that's probably where we're talking about. Uh, here. Uh, everybody has some trouble at some point at some time. We're not really so concerned about isolated incidents. We're concerned about repeat offenders, I guess, if that makes sense. And uh, I know from some experience of, of working around the State Board of Elections 
they do hold hearings um, regularly, particularly after elections that they address complaints and problems. And if you looked at the list of counties that were there in front of them, my suspicion is there would be some names that popped up fairly regularly over the years. Okay. Um, so that that's kind of, I think, the, uh, the thought process here. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Other questions from any of the committee members? Um, Representative Williams, what, 12? Go ahead. Thank you. My question is, uh, who can make complaints on the board? Does it have to come from uh, one of the political parties? Could it come from the public? Could it come from the county commissioners? Exactly who seeing things happen and you know, sometimes um, somebody might push back. So if it's the public or political party, how would they go about making the complaint? Would they make it to the Secretary of State's office, the uh, State Election Board, or who would they actually go to to file the complaint to get this review panel set up? Is that a question for me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, it is. Yes, sir. Okay. So um, obviously, as the chairman has always stated, that people can make complaints now to the Board of Elections, and the Board of Elections has the ability to take action. So this is, like the chairman said, a situation where the Board of Elections, for whatever reason, is not taking appropriate action when there continues to be uh, infractions over probably multiple elections. And then in that case, uh, anybody could go to either their board of commissioners in the case of a city at their city council or the secretary of state's office and, and complain that there needs to be uh, intervention here. And then that would be the call of the board of commissioners, city council, or the secretary of state's office to actually call for the review panel. So again, anybody could, could suggest to those three entities that there needs to be action taking place since the Board of Elections is not taking appropriate action. And then that, that's how the outside intervention could be called for. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mueller, one of the things that I wanted us to focus on today is, is I talk to other members um, and folks generally associated with elections, there seems to be somewhat of a consensus that there ought to be some mechanism to deal with a reoccurring problem, maybe not everybody, but somewhat of a consensus. And so what really matters, I think, is and probably separates people in their opinions is how, exactly how. And so would you one more time briefly outline the step-by-step -step, uh, um, approach in your legislation? Uh, because as we compare yours now to some others, I want that to be fresh in everybody's mind. Sure, absolutely. So um, again, for routine problems, hopefully the the uh, Board of Elections, local Board of Elections will take care of those. But if the Board of Elections is not doing their job and it, it's found that uh, they continue to not do their job or, or, or if maybe they're even violating state law, then we need an outside mechanism to deal with a Board of Elections that's not doing their job. And so either a county commission, a city council, or the Secretary of State's office could call for this review board to be put into place. And, and these, this review board, let me remind you, is made up of experts. So these are these will be people that really know how local elections are run, should be run. There would be sort of a model. So we're going to get um, you know, two election, local election officials from other counties where they do it right, as well as a staff person from the Secretary of State's office. And those three individuals will go in there. They will do an investigation and they'll determine, you know, it. And Clint, let, let me interrupt you if I may. I apologize. Who puts that? Who 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 is empowered to put that board together? That three-person panel. Well, in in our draft, I think we call for the Secretary of State to do that. But you okay. all may want the State Elections Board to do that. Either sure. way. Okay. No okay. okay. So like that. that's the the first step is that that, that that empowers an entity to to pull a trigger that begins this appointment of a three-person panel. Go ahead. Yes. And in the case of the example I gave you with our board of assessors, it's Department of Revenue that does that. So they would they would have a list probably of competent local election officials that would be willing to serve on these uh, boards. And they would choose two local elected officials, excuse me, election officials, as well as the uh, staffers from the Secretary of State's office. They would go in and do their investigation. So if you got expertise here that can determine 
you know, are these complaints valid complaints? You know, is there a pattern here where the, the board, local board of elections is not doing their job? And then they're going to write up a formal report. And that's a public report. So, you know, the press has a chance to look at that report. Everybody has a chance to look at that report. So that's going to put a lot of pressure. Just that in and of itself is going to put a lot of pressure on all the players involved to do something. Because now you've got an independent public report saying we got problems. And then based on that report, if, if the report goes so far to say that um, there's grounds for removal here, then we would just go ahead and suspend at that point in time, automatically suspend the um, the, the county board of elections. Uh, and then while the suspension has occurred, we would then appoint somebody to basically fill that vacancy uh, while they're while the, they are suspended. And then so so in other words, this three person panel has the ability to trigger the suspension of the whole board of elections and the superintendent. Yes. And we may need to add, I was just got a text message from somebody about possibly needing to add the superintendent. So we can do it either way. Obviously, you, you suspend the board of elections. They are the, ultimately the ones in charge here. Right. Uh, but you can go so far as to also su suspend the superintendent. And also. one question, what what power does this three-person panel have to investigate? And when I think of an investigation, you want to talk to people. You want to see documents. Uh, you want other records, and many of those people and documents will be in possession of the Board of Elections or the supervisor. So um, is there any enforcement mechanism that if there's not cooperation to, to talk, talk with people or, or look at records? And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a fine detail, and it may be something you need to think about. I didn't know if something was in the bill already, though. Well, obviously our intent would be they would have access to any information, any sure. record. They need um, if we need to put something in there to do that uh, beyond just them having the power to do the investigation, then we would certainly be open to any additional language. Okay. For, um, so you at the point when I interrupted, I think you at the point suspension has occurred now because the report recommends it. Right. So once once suspension has occurred, uh, we want to get those people out of there immediately and then fill the vacancy. But then we want another check. So again. Um, the, the suspended officials should have the ability to go before a superior court judge uh, and then basically argue their case. And at the end of the day, the superior court judge will will basically say, yes, uh, I, you know, I agree with the, the findings of the, the panel and I agree that these people should be removed or the judge will say, no, there's not um, valid evidence here to remove these officials. So if, if, if is that how it works in your board of assessors uh, situation? Yes. OK. So, because of the nature of what the Board of Assessors does, setting values for property taxes, um, the, the state law doesn't allow the Board of Commissioners just to remove them um, because of the, I guess there's a fear of politics playing into that. And so that's why you've got the Superior Court judge that's there as a check to make sure that there's a, a valid reason to remove them. So in this case, if the Superior what? Court judge said, yes, you could remove them, then, then they could be removed at that point in time. So once the, 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 they have been suspended because the board has recommended it, um, who then has the power to replace them with someone to carry on as the function of the board of elections or the superintendent? Does so that question make the, sense? During, right. the, during the suspension period, the uh, board of commissioners or the, or the city council would put somebody in that vacancy to run the office until the Superior Court judge has an opportunity to review the case and, and make a final determination. Mm -hmm. Now, if the um, the, the, governing, judge, the governing body of the of the county yeah. or city involved, yes, okay, all right. And if the judge comes back and says yes, there's grounds for removal, then uh, they would be removed, and then the governing authority would appoint somebody to fill the unexpired term. That's how we have it um, right now. There, you you all could come up with something different than that. Um, but obviously there has to be a way to, to, to fill that position permanently. Well, it, as I think about it, you, quite often your county commissioners do fill a seat or two on the board of elections anyway. Uh, yeah. So that, that's one of the bodies, they certainly fund them. So that's one of the bodies that, that, that probably fills a seat or two anyway. Yes, that's correct. Not, not always, but maybe. And so, and so the judge upholds the finding, then, then basically the, the, who fills the seat on the board of elections the same way it was filled the first time maybe the parties if that's what the local legislation says or in, in the county commission maybe 
Yeah, it's different in different counties, but we would basically appoint somebody to fill the unexpired term. And then when the term is expired, it would be filled the same way that that seat would be filled based on local legislation or whatever, whatever, whatever mechanism you have for filling that. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Chairman Smyre has a question. Hi, Clint, how are you today? Good, how are you, Leader Smyre? Pretty good. Um, I'm trying to understand this. Um, can this happen during the act, during the course of an election, as an election is in process? Can this possibly happen? In other words, so, uh, can can elected officials from another county go and investigate uh, ongoing uh, my elections are ongoing in, a, in in their counties? Can they do they, they lead their responsibilities? You know, how does that how does that process work? I mean. So we've left a lot of discretion in here to the Secretary of State's office as far as the timing of the impanelment of this, this board and how, and how long it takes. Again, that's up to you all in this committee if you all want to put deadlines and time frames in there. I would assume, obviously, if you're in the middle of the election, this would not likely happen in the middle of an election. This would be something that would happen in between elections because, uh, you're again, you're pulling um, election superintendents from other counties to be part of this. And it's going to take them time to go in and actually look at what's going on and to write up a report. This is not something that can just happen instantaneously. And as I said earlier, it's something that I envision would take a month, if not several months to, to complete. Because I was thinking, Mr. Chairman, may I follow up? Absolutely. Uh, I was thinking that the superintendent and the board, in some instances, that's the same. I mean, isn't that, isn't that the same thing, the superintendent and the board? I mean, when that... No. I'm not a, an expert on elections, but my understanding is sometimes a superintendent serves on the board. Yes. Okay. Thank you. But we would not have any, these would be outside. In other words, nobody from the county that's being investigated would be serving on this panel. These would be people from other counties. So I think hopefully some independent. I, I think Chairman Smyra has hit upon one of the complexities of our local boards of elections. Um, some of our counties, 30 something, I think still are run by probate judges. And then you have a board of registrars that assists the probate judge. And he had maybe has employees that runs election. Those counties are not all small, but they tend to be some of our smaller counties. Then you have in other counties, the majority, the large majority have boards of elections. And that is where the uh, many times the superintendent and the registrar is combined and the board hires and fires and plays a role. Uh, such that the probate judge would, I guess, in, in, in those other counties. But those seats on the boards of election, whether it be a three-seat panel in my county, a five-seat panel in another county I'm familiar with, probably seven and some others, are filled in different ways. That's by local legislation. In other words, sometimes the legislative delegation fills a couple of seats, sometimes the county commission. I know in one instance a city gets a spot on the board uh, to fill. A school board has filled a spot. Quite often the parties... Democrat Republican Party can both have members put on the board. I even know a situation where a Superior Court judge appoints the chairperson of that. So th that's kind of all over the board um, uh, as far as how the boards are filled. Any other questions for uh, Mr. Mueller? Uh, Rick, are you number 12? Uh, Representative Williams? Yes, sir, number 12. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is, uh, you mentioned appointing someone to fill the unexpired term. Uh, how about maybe just a point through the election mm -hmm. cycle rather than the unexpired term? And mm -hmm. if it's in the middle of, say, early voting and discrepancies and things are happening and you go in like <clears throat> a county where the board of elections, but you have the election supervisor and the board of elections just doesn't, they're not that active and they couldn't run the election that SOS can send in a supervisor to oversee the rest of that election cycle. And um, I mean, there, there's some things there that um, I was chief registrar at Baldwin County for 16 years. So we were board of registrars and our uh, probate judge ran the election, but I'm looking at the, the counties that has an election board. Um, and you know, you, you remove that election superintendent the other board members are not qualified possibly to finish that election out. And there may not be anyone in the county qualified to walk in and take over an election. So there's got to be some, 
uh, something else has got to be put in that even if you leave that person in there and you bring in somebody to supervise them, look over their shoulder to make sure that everything is being done correctly. Um, a lot of moving parts there, Mr. Chairman. I, that's that's that, that's the complexity of this issue, and that's why we're going to look at those several different models today. Um, and Chairman Smyre made a good point. Um, you know, what do you do if the middle of elections going on and this problem arises? Well, my suspicion is that the straw that breaks the camel's back was probably going to occur in an election. And then you're going to get through that and recognize what happened. And then the investigation probably begins. So probably uh, it may not always happen that way, but probably there's a tipping point that's reached. And it probably comes after something goes very wrong in an election. Uh, is, is just a guess as far as how that might um, happen. Um, Mr. Mueller, thank you for being with us today. If you could hang on in case other questions come up, uh, of course, if your schedule doesn't allow, we understand that too. But Chairman uh, Shaw Blackman has joined us. He originally had the bill that was introduced, 493. I know that um, after his introduction of that bill or at some point during the same time, um, that triggered a conversation with ACCG, which led us to the substitute proposal that we just discussed. I would like for Chairman Blackman, however, to um, talk with us about the original bill he introduced and the, another method possibly uh, that it provides for uh, trying to solve this problem. Chairman Blackman? Is that? You're good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I think we went over uh, in subcommittee and then we talked about this briefly at our last meeting. Um, the And thank you. You reminded me you had a subcommittee meeting on this, didn't you? We, we you did. did. Yeah, go ahead. Thank um, you. I forgot about that. So the, the, the premise of this bill would be kind of an, a, a, you know, administrative assistance training etc if you have a situation where a county has been investigated you have an initial hearing and you find that that, that there is reason to go um, in and assist you have an 18 month window to do so um, and then you turn it back over to uh, to the governing authority at that time and it has some some limitations and guardrails but what it does is it, it does allow the, the state election board to investigate, hold a hearing. If they vote in favor of, they can go in and, and, and help this uh, county get its, its feet back under it and then move back out of the county. I think the one suggestion, and, and again, we welcomed all, all suggestions, and the reason that ACCG brought forth their substitute was there was a request for some additional judicial review in the process. And, um, I, I gave the short version, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer any questions or dive into it, you know, to any other de greater degree as you prefer. So as I, as I, as I understand, Chairman Blackman, uh, the State Board of Elections would conduct a hearing, uh, and if they found necessary, um, they could temporarily, on line 23, assert direct control over the local administration um, of that election body. Um, and it looks like at some point they could appoint the Secretary of State if needed to assume uh, some responsibilities. Yes, sir. The, and then they, the State Board of Election could lift uh, the, I'll use the word term, probation. They could lift the probation at some point when things got straightened out. Is that kind of how the fu it functions? Yes, sir. And, and the intent, um, as, as I've talked with ACCG about, I think, you know, we kind of, discussing how the cost would be absorbed would be that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily expect the locals to spend any additional dollars, but that the funds that they currently spend to run the elections and run these processes would be afforded to that, this process as well, and any cost over and above would be borne elsewhere. Okay. Any questions of Chairman Blackman and the original House Bill 493 that he just discussed? Any further comments, Chairman Blackman? I do not. No, okay. Sir. Next, I'd like to ask um, Ryan Germany to come forward. Mr. Germany is uh, counsel with the Secretary of State's office, and there is some language that um, I had um, uh, asked somebody else to work on for me, and I asked him to review that, and um, he um, 
was able to explain well to me the version, and I apologize for not having a copy in front of you today, but it is just another format whereby we would um, have a, a different way of uh, dealing with this problem. And Mr. Jeremy, could you uh, enlighten us on that other possibility that we discussed? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. This is um, some language that we started working on last year uh, with, with some outside counsel as well. Um, and it's really based on the model that, that you brought up earlier um, where the governor can um, go in and appoint a new school board right. uh, if, if that comes up. So um, it really revolves around the state election board here. The state election board regularly hears cases that involve uh, county basically um, non-compliance with law or, or other issues with, with elections. Um, the state election board already has subpoena authority. It has an, uh, the state, the secretary of state's investigative um, branch does the investigations. Um, and this basically sets up a process through that where if uh, I think the way it's set up, any county commissioner or a, sort, a certain portion of the county delegation, uh, uh, depending on the size of the delegation, can petition the state election board to hold such a hearing. Um, and then the state election board has to determine, um, you know, basically um, if it reaches the, the magnitude and it's set out in the language that would, it would require that it would, the state election board would then replace the superintendent. The superintendent, remember, um, is the actual board of elections. Um, and then there's an elections director who, who works for the board of elections. Uh, but in this case, it would be the superintendent, the, the actual board. Um, and then there's a mechanism where the superintendent can, can apply for a re, uh, basically reappointment. Um, that might look like if the county determines, okay, here's how we can make some changes and then apply for, you know, reinstatement that, that, that would meet kind of pass muster according to the state election board. Um, and then also that would then go to, uh, at the end of the day, that could go to that's what it's in the law. That's it called a final agency action, which can be reviewed by a superior court judge. Um, so that's the model that, that this sets out. It utilizes kind of the existing oversight structure of the state election board to oversee counties uh, and, and specifically their elections superintendents and, and kind of puts adds the part uh, from the school board uh, uh, um, replacement when 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 it's appropriate so that triggering mechanism again it would be the a complaint from the local government or the local board of elections it's a petition from um in the language from any county commissioner um or from depending on the uh size of the delegation for counties represented by more than three members in the House and more than three in the Senate, uh, at least two members of the House and Senate for counties represented by less than uh, fewer than four in the House and fewer than four in the Senate, at least one member. Uh, is, it, is, it, is that similar to the triggering mechanism for the school board? I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, that right. was the model. So I believe that's where that came from. Some similarity, I maybe. I can't say that's for sure. Okay. And once the State Board of Elections triggered their investigation, they would have the power to remove uh, and um, or suspend uh, until such time as the situation was straightened out. And then there would be a reinstatement, I guess. There's, there's a hearing and the State Election Board um, would have to find by a preponderance of the evidence that the superintendent has committed at least three violations of the elections code over the past two general election cycles that have not been sufficiently remedied, um, or by clear and convincing evidence um, that the superintendent for at least two elections within a two year period demonstrated nonfeasance, malfeasance, or gross negligence in the administration of elections. So, but sui sponte, the, the, the state board couldn't begin an investigation. They'd have to have that triggering mechanism. Under this uh, current language, yes, sir. Okay, all right. Any questions of um, Mr. Germany? Let's say, um, Chairwoman Smith. Again, it goes to the time frame in concern with close elections and a time period. How long would that take? 
So it, it would first depend on, you know, getting the, the uh, complaint from the count from a county commissioner or the delegation. Um, but then it says uh, that any hearing that's going to be held has to be held, I think, no fewer than 30 or no later than 90 days after after that complaint. Um, I think it would be a little bit quicker than the uh, than the structure that um, Mr. Mueller was talking about, because the state election board already already basically has that function for counties. This really just adds kind of a, an, another um, punishment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions from any members of the committee for Mr. Germany regarding the model that he discussed? The um, one of the other matters that was discussed, uh, I think, when Chairman Blackwell was talking about was uh, the ability to fund whatever was happening. I guess in your your analysis, um, there was um, uh, you are um, the State Board of Elections and Secretary of State's offices doing the investigation, so that would have to fall under them basically to to staff that. Correct. And, and then, then if they actually took over the, at some point for some time period, the local board, somebody is stepping into the election superintendent's shoes and has the ability to spend the money that's already been budgeted. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. It's, uh, the language says that the county can't lower the amount already budgeted and has to spend whatever is sufficient. Um, and, at the, and at the same time, they have to be paying uh, the old superintendent. So there's definitely a cost to a county if it gets to to that level, which is you know, what I envision is a very high level of uh, basically malfunction. So one of the things that we talked about earlier, and you may have heard us discussing, was that I've been to some state board of election hearings when there are complaints against counties. I've seen the agenda three or four times, and maybe more than that. And you do, it seems to me, seem to be sometimes the same counties that are there over and over again. Um, it may be hard to quantify, and I'm not asking you to call any names of any counties, but I mean, um, uh, are there literally dozens of counties that never have to appear before the State Board of Elections because they don't have these kind of problems? Yes, um, that's at, at least dozens. Um, and I would say there's not more than a handful that I would consider um, repeat kind offenders. of repeat who are who are up there, especially um, repeat for for similar issues. Okay. Um, and the funny thing about those counties is it's not it's not like it's just metro counties or just rural counties um, that fall into that bucket. There's a there's a mix of uh, there's metro counties and rural counties that fall into that into that bucket. Okay. All right. Um, I know that in Chairman Blackman's legislation, there is a limit of eight counties. Is that right, Chairman, that could be intervened at one time? Go ahead. I'll turn your mic on. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I believe that was akin to 5%. And again, much of it was taken after the model that I think was used within the school system. Your, your legislation also? Much of it, yes, sir. Is, is that cor correct to the best of your memory? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Okay. But, 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 the, the, but once again, I think I didn't realize your model was also somewhat after the, 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 the school systems. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Germany? All right. I have been... Uh, um, texting with um, Butch Miller, the president pro tem of the Senate, and he said he is on his way over here. Um, he has Senate bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. He has um, Senate bill 89, which has already passed out of the Senate. It presents one more different model that I wanted him to be able to talk to us about. So we will stand at ease for just a moment. And i tell you when the Senator comes in, let's all rise. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Burnout, did you have any? Now, really, I want y'all all to stand up at once when he walks in the room, okay? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I'm just a little confused. Um, I thought we had already voted on 493 when it was put into 531. Uh, no, that's incorrect. There okay. were some other of Chairman um, Blackman's bills that were put into the to the larger bill, but this was not one of them. Is, am I right, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, yes, sir. I, it. it kind of has confused me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they were okay. sequential for 91 and, and 93 were, were both considered in the larger bill, but the, I mean, excuse me, 490, 
See, I even get confused. This is 493, 491 and 492 are included. Okay, so thank you. So we'll stand at ease for just a minute. If anybody wants to grab something to drink or uh, make a, um, a pit stop, uh, we'll stand at ease. But remember, when he comes in, let's all stand up.
I've known that. I've been here earlier. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't want to go, but if I go, I want Rick to take me. All right. I'll be the last to let you down. Oh, well, there you go. We got a million of them. <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Well, Mr. President, we appreciate you coming over. My pleasure. To visit with us. Um, prior to your being able to join us, um, ACCG presented an option that they have worked on uh, that uh, involves the possible intervention into a board of elections that is having uh, repeat problems. Um, we had um, Chairman uh, Shaw Blackman, who had also worked on the bill, and he talked about a, a slightly different model. And then we had uh, Mr. Germany with the Secretary of State's office talk about some language that I had spoken to him about earlier that last year was was thought about somewhat fashioned after the uh, the code, which currently allows the governor through a process to step in with the school board and try to remedy some of the problems. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, what I wanted to do, and I really appreciate you coming by is allow the committee to have a chance to hear about the bill you passed through the Senate, not a formal hearing at this point, but nonetheless a good time to help us have further input onto the different ideas that are out there to, to solve what I think is all the same problems. So the floor is yours and we appreciate you coming over, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for having me and thank the members of the committee and let me first say that uh, whether it's this bill, uh, one of the other bills or a uh, combination thereof makes no matter to me. Uh, we just, what we wanna do is create a, a low performing jurisdictions. That's, what, that's the bottom line right there. I know that, um, you know, we had some conversation when I was uh, crafting this bill and presenting this bill and, uh, you know, I, I, one of the questions became, why did you find this necessary? And what, well, it puzzles me why the state of Florida with 20 million population of 20 million folks can count their votes faster than some of our counties of less than a million can count their votes. So that, that in and of itself is problematic. So this is an elections assistance officer and the elections assistance officer, uh, would have elections experience as either a superintendent, excuse me, or a supervisor, uh, a minimum of five years, uh, uh, managing uh, and uh, supporting a election system in the counties. Um, he would have a role, he or she would have a role of identifying elections assistance coaches, uh, significant experience in training election administrative administration and election law. Um, and the whole focus would be supporting, encouraging, coaching, mentoring, sharing best practices with low performing, uh, elections jurisdictions. Uh, our first step would be to identify those low performing agencies. And we would do that through secretary of state, through, uh, various models, various, uh, I guess we could say the number of comments we get on different election uh, counties. Um, but identifying those, identifying the superintendents and give them an opportunity to receive some training, some on-site evaluation, and after that, some on-site training. And then uh, within 90 days, if they have, if they've refused to take heed or unable to perform to a standard that would be uh, set by the elections uh, office, then the board may suspend that individual. And that, that may, by the board, I mean the board of elections, the state board of elections, meaning the, um, well, you know, as you all are all well aware of the makeup of that board, it's a nonpartisan board, I, I would add. Um, written notice of the potential uh, suspension would be tendered to the individual. And then within, uh, a set time period, I forget offhand if it's a week or 10 days, I think it's 10 days. The superintendent may uh, request a hearing or an appeal. And then uh, afterwards, the superintendent could petition for the board of, uh, to be reinstated uh, after, 30, after the 30 days suspension. And after the 30 days uh, suspension uh, before the hearing, he or she could uh, correct the administration, excuse me, the uh, functions and hopefully be reinstated. And this would be designed to help low performing 
uh, counties, help low, low performing elections offices that would uh, have the opportunity to uh, provide a service that all Georgians could be proud of. And that was basically the long and the short of it. So, Senator, one of the, the triggering mechanism would be an investigation by the State Board of Elections for whatever reason they deem necessary. That's, to, that's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then if they find uh, due cause, I guess, there would be an, a, a person that's appointed to them to go in and provide assistance, which probably would also amount to a little bit of an investigation, someone on the inside watching the process. That's is correct. That, is that a fair? That's, that's a fair assessment. And that individual would be working within the uh, Secretary of State's office. Okay. And, and then um, that person is supposed to report back to the State Board of Elections after any any certain period of time or? Uh, not, okay. 90 days. Give nine, the, 90 days. Basically, have a 90 day cure period. 90 day cure period. Yeah, to, yeah. For that elections officer to demonstrate that they, he or she have, has in, uh, installed or instituted the uh, best changes, practices. best practices, what have you, that would. Yeah that would improve on their performance. And when that, after that, that three month period, when the report comes back to the state board elections, they can then choose to, if, 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 if the situation is not improving sufficiently, they can remove the, uh, the superintendent and the board of elections for 30 days and for 30 days, 30 days. And they, and during that 30 days, they have an opportunity to appeal within 10, if they want to, to appeal the courts. to, to the board, to the, to the board, okay. to the board. Right. And then if they, they could be reinstated or they could be denied a reinstatement. Okay. But the key is that we want to give the opportunity for uh, best practices and, and you know, coach them up basically. Under your, under your measure, if the, if the state board of elections did not reinstate them, who, who replaces them? Who chooses the replacements? The replacement would be chosen by the uh, board of elections. Board of elections. Yes, okay. sir. I got you. All right. All right. Good questions for, um, the president pro tem of the Senate. Any, I saw one light flashing earlier, but maybe, maybe I asked it for them. Okay. Well, we certainly do appreciate you coming over today. Anything you'd like to wrap up with before we. I'd like to say uh, thank you to the, com this committee for working on this very important issue. Really and truly. Uh, I, I've not, I've never not been one of these uh, stop the steal folks. You know, I've not been, but I've not been one of these. Everything's perfect folks. Um, I, I believe that we have some opportunity to regain the trust and confidence of the general public. And when the public loses trust and confidence in their elections, and then they lose trust and confidence in their monetary system, then they lose trust and confidence in general, and we find ourselves spiraling downward. And I think that the trust and confidence of our elections are paramount to a free society. One of the strongest building blocks that it all rest upon. I would agree. Thank Absolutely. you, sir. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate you coming over today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank so you. We, may, may we remain seated as you leave? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I was, for the Senator. I, I, okay. I, I was being brief because it's 335 on a Friday afternoon and I'm in sales and no good salesman works on Friday afternoon. <laughs> okay. Good enough. <laughs> Take care. We'll see you. Thank, Thank you, you Senator. We appreciate you coming over. All right. Any any comments before we wrap up this uh, this portion of the hearing today? Okay, um, Mr. Mueller, if you're still online with us, we appreciate you uh, being there today, and we appreciate you being here with us today. And then you can be dismissed if you want to, or you can hang around for what we're going to do next if you want to. Thank you all right. for having me today. Thank you so much. Originally. I did not anticipate us having a full committee hearing today, and I had asked that a subcommittee hear a bill, but since we're here as a full committee, I'm just going to go ahead and pull that up, and uh, and instead of switching pace to places and rearranging, uh, we'll just hear House Bill 228. Um, Representative Byrd, you want to come forward to us and present House Bill 228? Yes, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I greatly appreciate you taking the time and look to listen to HB 228, which is about a driver's license and an ID. <clears throat> the right to vote in a free and fair election is fundamental to our civil society. The sacred right cannot be taken for granted, 
nor can we afford for it to be eroded away for lack of confidence in our elections. We have an obligation to do everything possible to ensure election security and integrity. An ID creates a high level of confidence. I offer a simple common sense solution to add another degree of security to the actual voting process. HB 228 has two goals. Currently, there is nothing in state law that prohibits driver's license or an ID card issued to foreign nationals from being registered, being regarded as a proper identification at our polls when photo ID is presented. HB 228 contains language to amend the law. Many Georgians may be surprised to learn Georgia issues a driver's and official ID credential to non-citizens that are nearly identical to what many voters use as their official ID to vote. And I have given a handout, I believe, of a driver's license that looks just like this. This is our driver's license. The only difference in appearance from mine are the words limited term. I also handed out another driver's license that has limited term across the top in capital letters. Under my bill, this ID would not legally be a proper ID in future elections, beginning with 2022 primary vote. I've heard objections to this very popular concept that say non-citizens cannot register to vote, so there is no need for my concern of this loophole. I disagree and point to the problems in the use of the motor voter registration system in other states reported by the Associated Press, NPR, and the Pew Center, which I also gave you articles that were printed. Furthermore, there is nothing in state law that prohibits these non-citizens driver's license or ID cards to be used as proper identification or photo ID for voting purposes. This obvious and needless loophole in Georgia law needs to be fixed. Currently, the law states that proper identification for presentation to a poll worker when voting consists of a Georgia driver's license, a valid Georgia voter ID, or a valid ID issued by a branch, department, agency, or entity of the state of Georgia or any other state, or the US authorized by law to issue personal identification provided that such ID card contains a photograph of the elector. The, all, the law also allows for acceptance of valid US passports, government employee IDs, a valid tribal ID containing a photograph of the elector and a military ID. The law does not explicitly exclude the driver's license or ID cards the Department of Driver Services issues to non-citizens of any description. I want to add another degree of security to the actual voting process. My bill will change current law to require DDS to add the phrase, bearer, not a US citizen, not voter ID, which I also left on your desk and it would be Oh, anyway, it's on the top. The words across there would be on that ID. Americans of all political leanings deserve to know that our elections were carried out with utmost integrity. That's why I hope you will join me in support of HB 228 to ensure election integrity and restore trust at the ballot box for each of its residents. You have a substitute on your desk. Uh, and that was one of my questions for yes. you initially. Representative Bird, you want us to work off that substitute? Correct. Okay. It is LC412954S. Okay, we, we have that okay. passed out. Okay. Thank you. Let me let me ask you some questions sure. about this. I've, I've tried to educate myself some on this, but there's a lot of questions I don't know about the registration process and I think we still have some Secretary of State folks here, so y'all hang out. I may ask y'all some questions too. But as I understand it, that um, when one gets 
a driver's license. If you are not a citizen, they don't register to, to vote at that point. And so if they don't register you to vote, when you get your driver's license, if you're a non-citizen, why are we concerned that someone would use that driver's license then to be able to go vote? Well, the dr dr driver services does, in fact, there are wording, there is wording on the bottom of the application for your driver's license, and you can opt out. But at this point, the majority of people that work for DDS do not ask for anyone to opt out, and they just are registering people to vote. And, and this may be um, part of the process I need to learn about, and I'll try to ask more questions about it. Sure. But other than that, I think, did you say a question about that on the bottom? There's a question about whether or not you're a citizen and it, and it affects whether or not they register. Is that what you're saying? That is correct. Okay, so there's other than that, you're saying that, to your knowledge, there's no other check against other databases like the Social Security Administration or anything like that before they register you to vote? I am going to ask the, my expert witness to come up. Well, hold um, on. We'll, 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 yeah. we'll get to the folks. Okay, but sure. if you don't know, that's fine because I don't know and, and, and I'm educating myself. So Sure. It is my understanding that if you go to get a driver's license, mm -hmm. you are, there is supposed to be a cross check reference in, um, on with a database. That's my understanding. Social Security Administration is one that I, I think they check with. Correct. Right. That would be correct. And right. then, but there is also an opt out, which they are not asking people if they want to opt out. And so then they are getting registered to vote. And in fact, this summer, there were people that went um, door to door, um, students knocking on doors and asking if they were registered to vote. They gave them their driver's license and they just sent their forms on in. So how would you not know that they are actually a citizen or a non-citizen when they are knocking on doors to get you to register to vote? And certainly these articles that I have given to you, Glitches in California, I mean, we are all human and we make mistakes and I am not accusing anyone anywhere that there was anything unethical or illegal done in our state of Georgia, but we are human and mistakes are made. As, as you, I know that you're aware, um, one bill that has passed this committee that is now pending before the house would switch us from a signature verification, for example, on absentee ballots to checking that driver's license number. So if non-citizenship were caught at the issuance of the driver's license and so recorded in the system, then when a person either tried to vote in person or they sent in an absentee ballot request with that driver's license number, they should be rejected as not being able to vote because they're not registered. Would you agree? I would agree with that, yes. Okay, great, thank you. All right, we do have some other questions. Is that representative number four? Representative Martin, are you number four? Chairman Martin. Mr. Chairman, I think you covered my, my question. I just, I, I think the question I would have, and it may be way better to wait to uh, somebody from Secretary of State's office. I think one can try to register to vote, but they check the citizenship before the registration is completed. That was the question I was going to ask. And I, Same I was one just, I was asking. Yeah, I suspect way. Representative Bird, might, we might need some help getting that answer. For sure, we'll, we'll try. My to understanding was just Attempting to register to vote doesn't mean you get to register to vote if you're not otherwise qualified to, to vote. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep that query in mind as, as we move through. And um, I see Mr. Germany back there. I'm going to ask him if, he, if possible, can you hang around? Because we might bring you up and ask you some of those questions. And if you don't know the answer, you can start texting right now. And Because <laughs> and, uh, I, I know you know the people that probably would. So um, um, any further questions for Representative Byrd before we go to some of our witnesses? Don't see any at this time. Thank you, Representative. You just hang around. We'll be of course might bring you back up with some of the questions. Um, do you have anybody you want us to call first after you? I do. I would like to call uh, Mr. King, please. All right, Mr. King, uh, you did sign up, so come on up and introduce yourself, and um, we'd be happy to hear from you. Good morning, Mr. Good morning. Chairman, members of the afternoon, committee. actually. <laughs> it's been a very long morning. Yes, sir. Please forgive me. One, two, three. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Please forgive me. My name is D.A. King. I am president of the Dustin Inman Society. I've been coming down to this campus at my own expense for 17 years now, and I've spent considerable time trying to change 
the appearance of non-citizen driver's licenses. I like to think that I have heard every objection to doing exactly that, but each time we're down here, I, I hear a new one. If I may, I'm not going to be long, but I want to make it clear that I nearly tried to hook uh, Senator Brooks Miller here to do my presentation for me because of the eloquent way that he said that he's neither on the stop to steal or everything is perfect side. I, I agree with that. And I hope that everybody thinks as I do and apparently Senator Miller does that we should do everything possible to make sure that we restore confidence in our election system. Currently we have, as Representative Byrd has said, we have foreign nationals here in Georgia to whom we are issuing um, credentials, including driver's licenses, permits, and identification cards that are not much different than United States citizens. The goal here, uh, again, as Representative Byrd said, is to make some distinction so that nobody gets confused. So on the bill, Inserting language into law that simply says a non-citizen's credential is unacceptable as proper identification at the voting poll, I, I, I view as a, a chicken soup at the minimum kind of thing. It's certainly not going to hurt the process. I'm, I'm very curious about why it's not already in law. And then again, the second part of the bill to mark the fact that the bearer is not a US citizen, seems to me to be a guaranteed way to make sure that anybody wouldn't be confused at the poll. So the main argument has always been, as we just heard, why would we go to trouble to put these things into law and make these changes if we're going to run on the assumption that it is impossible for a non-citizen to ever be registered to vote? And I don't think the from experience, I don't think the, the discussion should be about whether or not a non-citizen struggles to go illegally register to vote, but whether or not the system in place accidentally through human error or systemic error registers somebody to vote who is not a US citizen. Um, and it's not just me saying that, there's a handout and it may have been duplicated, I didn't know what Representative Byrd was going to pass out, but this is from NPR and, and the sub headlines, some non-citizens do wind up registered to vote, but usually not on purpose. I have been in seminars myself in Washington where witness after witness would tell very detailed stories about non-citizens being registered to vote with the motor voter program. This is an Associated Press story that I have handed out with the same information. Um, I, I didn't have the resources or the time to copy in print all of the online articles. I am here asking that the committee pass to the floor Representative Byrd's bill that simply says if the system lets, our, lets us down or if a non-citizen takes it upon themselves to make the attempt successfully to register to vote, that we are, that we are ahead of the game and we have in place barriers to that that registration resulting in an illegal vote. Um, an illegal vote or even an illegal registration is, is easily stopped. And I, I, I can't imagine a no vote on this. I, I'm sure I don't know all the arguments. I, 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 each day I hear another one. I want us to add something else that people are going to bring up. I'll do it very quickly, Mr. Chairman, but um, I've been studying the Real ID Act for years and years and years, and a lot of people think somehow that Real ID would prevent a state from doing anything on their driver's license. And while I'm here, I would respectfully make it clear to all concerned that the Real ID Act passed after the horror of 9-11 in 2005, as far as driver's licenses and ID cards go, merely says that a state can do whatever they want, but if you want your ID to be accepted, your driver's license to be federally accepted identification for things like boarding an aircraft, airliner, uh, entering a federal building or a military base, then you have to fulfill certain requirements. Beyond that, you can have a driver's license like the one I have in my pocket right now that is not Real ID Act approved. After October 22nd, I believe, I cannot board an airliner with what I have in my pocket. Uh, I was thinking about the irony of being here today because to be here 
I had to cancel my DDS appointment to upgrade my driver's license upon renewal. My birthday's coming up. I'm very, very anxious to take some questions. Well, let me start by asking the one that we were discussing with Representative Byrd. It, it, and you may or may not know this, but you, you might. It, it, is the assumption correct that if you are a non-citizen, that when you go get your driver's license, you are not given the ability to register to vote? It, it is my understanding. And if DDS is in the room, I would much rather you heard it from them than me. Um, but it is my understanding that there's legislation in, in, in the General Assembly right now to change motor voter from opt out to opt in. Mr. Chairman, if, if I'm mistaken on that, I'm, I'm quite willing to be corrected. So I guess my question though goes to when a, a person who's a non-citizen goes to get a driver's license, which we know there are instances where we allow them to do that, that's legal, that's not, that's not a problem. But to your knowledge, is there any check, not what they put on the form, but once they apply and put their information to the system, is there any cross check with any other system in the government to check to see whether or not they are indeed a citizen? And if they aren't, they're not registered to vote. There is a system called SAVE. It's called the Systematic Alien Verification for Entitlements Program, S-A-V-E. Now that system will kick back information. I'm very glad you asked this, because this is a different matter. The SAVE system on its website clearly says that they will report to administering agencies for public benefits, the immigration status of an applicant. This is very, very important. It's a good question, because I would have forgotten this. Here is the, the, the deal on that, if you will. SAVE, to repeat myself, SAVE says they will, tell, they will report a, an answer to a query from an administrating agency on immigration status. What they started doing years ago is reporting back employment authorization, which is completely different. We have an E-Verify system for that. I have done many open records requests through legislators to DDS to ask them the exact code that comes back from SAVE for a driver's license applicant. The last I heard, and according to the handbook I have from SAVE, which was updated last August, the response is employment authorized. So if I am here as, for example, a Mercedes Benz executive, and I go get a driver's license, state law says that that, system, that applicant has to be run through the SAVE system, but getting back a response that says, employment authorized or temporary employment authorized in no way answers the question that we sent in. So your, your point is that through the SAVE system, there is not a cross check sufficient. I, I, my point is, yes, sir, I, I, I guess, but what I'm saying is SAVE is, is, is doing what everybody assumes is a cross check, but they're not answering the question about immigration status. So we're not going to know but if that do, person is do registered. Do you know if there's, not. through our driver services, that there's another cross check besides just to that system? I, I would rather DDS answer that sure. question. And, the, and they are signed up, and we have, like I said, a, a representative from the Secretary of State's office that may be able to comment on as well. So we'll we'll ask them that question. Um, Chairman Martin, did you have a question? Uh, I did. If I could, you, you uh, since NPR had this, um, you, Folks, we may have it here. We have a lot of paper in front of us, but if I understood uh, your testimony, is NPR said that some people um, that were not citizens were registered to vote. That, that is my testimony. Yes. Uh, okay. It, was that in Georgia? I'm. It doesn't have to be. I'm just asking. It, it was not. Mr. Okay, that, that's fine. But you know, in in theory, following that, the, you, the 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 assertion would be it could be. My question, and, and what I sincerely am looking for here is if something breaks, if, if for some reason somebody has in, um, improper documents, they're not a citizen, but they wish to pull something over on the system, if you will, they have fake documents that says they are. If they fool the system and, and get registered to vote through DDS, they're gonna get a license that says they're a system. It's gonna be fraudulent, but, but they're gonna get a license that says they're a citizen. So this bill wouldn't, impact them because the words that we would want to put on there wouldn't be there because the system would think they're a citizen because of the fraudulent doc documents. Isn't that true? I, 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 I'm going to say that that's probably true, um, State Representative, but I'm also going to say that I'm not standing here purporting to have a knowledge of a foolproof way to present 100% of the problem. No, no, I, no, I understand. But what, what I'm getting at is if with this license, if, if we were to do that, if when they um, when somebody went to get a driver's license and they said they're not a, they're not a citizen at the time, 
And so on that driver's license, it put these words. But they went to vote, you know, two years later with that driver's license. And in that time, they had become a naturalized citizen. They could vote. I guess my, my question to you is, is, do you realize the driver's license is not what allows you to vote? You do know that, correct? I do, yes, sir. Okay. The driver's license just proves that that document, that number matches the, the individual holding it. And so regardless of what that says, at the time they present to vote, is it not true that they're again checked against registration to find out if they're a registered voter? And if they're not a citizen, they shouldn't be a registered voter. I, I, I agree again, state representative, and, and I respectfully, very respectfully, um, go along with one of the last words in your sentence was should. We, we are here trying to prevent, at least I am, what, what may happen. But, but I understand, but do you, do you understand that you can't turn someone away based on that, what that driver's license says? I, yes, sir, and again, if, if I may continue, that's one of the reasons I am here because there's no state law that says a non-citizen driver's license is unacceptable. It, do, it doesn't matter, it, is it not true? It doesn't matter what we print on that driver's license. If an individual presents it, it, it could say anything. And if they said they were a citizen, demanded to vote, they get to uh, cast a provisional ballot and that'll be ch chased at a later date. Isn't that true? I, I, I imagine that is true. I'm not sure. And, and again, I, I'm, trying, I'm not sure it has anything to do with what we're talking about. Well, it ha respectfully, it has everything to do with what we're talking about because I'm trying to understand how printing those words on the driver's license impacts their ability to vote. I mean, it might make you feel good, you know, but they, the, the, those words being on that document doesn't make them able to vote or take that away. They could, they could not have those words on the driver's license. In fact, they don't now. They have another uh, mark on the driver's license that denotes that. And yet when they present that to vote, my understanding is that is still checked against the voter's database to, to ensure they're a legal registered voter. And if they are a legal registered voter, they get to cast a ballot. Notwithstanding whatever they put on drive. I mean, you could fake driver's license and walk up and try to vote, but if you're not registered to vote, you can't vote. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Okay. But may, may I expand on my that is correct answer, Mr. State Representative? Sure. Thank you. Uh, when I went to vote in 2016, for example, the very nice poll worker, elderly, ordered me, asked me for my photo ID. Like everybody else, I gave her my driver's license. And when she gave it back, I very politely and calmly asked her, would you have accepted this if it said limited term on top? And she very cordially and immediately said, yes, we take all Georgia driver's licenses. And she could tell by apparently my curious look on my face and she called over her supervisor to whom I presented the exact same question. The supervisor said, yes, we take all driver's license. Neither of them had ever heard of limited term. I live in Cobb County. I have since heard from, uh, I forget the proper title, the head of Cobb County elections, who explained to me they don't teach that to people because it doesn't come up very often. My entire presentation has been that it is not impossible for people who are not United States citizens to get registered to vote. And that I think, as do a lot of other people, that if we change the law saying that the limited term driver's license is not only by law, currently acceptable ID, but mark it as, as, as not a citizen, I don't see the hole in that. No, and, and, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, I don't wanna get into debate with you, but you, you make my point exactly. If they got registered to vote, they had some document that proved they were a citizen, fraudulent or not. Uh, maybe, I, 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 I could have, I wish now that I had filled, printed out more than just the Associated Press and NPR because the Pew Center and, and literally tens or twenties of other news agencies, sorry, have, have articles like this. So I, I, I enjoy the conversation and I'm respectfully trying to answer. Let me ask the question, Mr. King, let me ask the question this way. Yes, sir. If Bob Smith is registered to vote 
and he presents a driver's license with this picture on it that has this language on the top, bear and not a U.S. citizen, not voter ID. But yet he is registered to vote and he hands that to the election officials. Will he be allowed to vote? I, I, the answer it's, that it's, it's, it's Mr. a situation Martin, I can't answer that. Well, the answer that Mr. Martin was going to is yes, he will be able to because it's not the driver's license that allows you to vote. The driver's license picture simply is a way to check if you are that the picture is the same as the person standing in front of them. I'm, I'm, that was the point I'm, that you were I'm, making. I'm sure that it's me, Mr. Chairman. I'm only somewhat more clear on the question. Sure. I meant no offense. We're going to go to Representative Bernal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, thank you for bringing this information. Um, I think you said this is your first time getting somebody to um, carry a bill for you on um, the um, to be able to put this information on there that um, people that aren't citizens can't vote. Is that right? I, I've been involved in multiple legis, uh, uh, measures that would address the language on driver's licenses. So I'm not sure how to answer your question. For anybody, um, I, I'm happy to have helped State Representative uh, Charlize Bird with her bill. This is the first time I have seen a bill that, that says limited term and, and add the language bear or not US citizen hyphen not voter ID. Okay. Is it true that you have said that immigrants are here to blow up buildings and kill your <laughs> children and you and me? No, ma'am, it's not. Okay. Is it true that you wait said- a minute, Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Mr. Chairman, may I, may I answer the question one at a time? Go ahead. Uh, Madam, you have just used a point um, from the Southern Poverty Law Center. The Southern Poverty Law Center makes great amount of money trying to blur the line between immigrants like my adopted sister and people on my board and people are here illegally, the proper name being illegal alien. In my whole life, I have never said that either one of them are here to blow up your buildings and kill you and me. What I did say, documented by multiple journalists at a presentation in Covington, Georgia to a GOP group was that I, had, I know because I've been to the border that people from countries with known, ter uh, from known, ter with known terrorist ties do come over our border illegally and I have personally seen them arrested. What I said was, terrorists are here to blow up your buildings. It wasn't immigrants. Okay, well, um, that's fine. But I ha still have my own question about that because when you start putting um, bearer, not a US citizen, not voter ID, and at the rate we're going to pushing uh, back um, our voting rights and suppressing the vote, the next, th we just celebrated the 100 year of women's suffrage movement when women finally got to vote. So what this tells me is that next, who knows what you're gonna to wanna to put on a, a driver's license. Because if we're gonna start bear not a US citizen, not voter ID, and we're gonna put it in bold, bold letters like it is here, then who's the next group that's gonna be targeted? Thank you. Is that a question? Sound like a statement. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Mr. King. We appreciate you being um, here today. I'm disappointed there aren't more questions. I am very grateful for the time, Mr. Chair. Well, hold on a second. Chairman Smyre does have a question for you. No, I'm going to pass. I, I, I just, okay. some of the things that you may have been alleged to have said in, in various uh, subject matters. And um, I'll just say this, it disturbs me. Okay. You're one of my favorite legislators, um, State Representative. If you have a question for me about anything having to do with me or my reputation, I'm happy to take it. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you, Mr. King. Okay, um, Mr. Germany, uh, I know that uh, we have someone from driver services on, and I know that a, a question has repeated several times. Would you like for us to go to them first, or can you comment on the question that's been asked? I believe I could comment, Mr. Okay. Chairman, and then uh, if I say anything wrong, then the uh, DDS can correct me. Okay, go ahead. So I wanted to just provide a little background for the committee on how citizenship check works uh, in Georgia as it relates to voter registration. Um, we have a citizenship check requirement in Georgia um, that does not occur at the photo ID stage when you show up to vote. That, that is for confirming that you are who you say you are. When you register to vote, 
that's when that's when your citizenship is checked and it and it, it's checked in two different ways. One, uh, the vast majority of people uh, who register probably in the in the 90s percentile um, register when they're when they are physically at Department of Driver Services. Um, we do have an opt in system uh, as the previous speakers uh, were, or you're automatically opted in unless you opt out. But if you are if you are not a citizen, then you are not even given the opportunity to opt in or opt out. Uh, DDS uh, knows whether or not you're a citizen. Georgia, um, since 2012, I believe, has only issued real IDs for driver's license or state ID. Um, and so what that requires, as some of you may remember when you have to go to DDS, it requires documentary proof of either citizenship, um, which is the same thing that's required when you register to vote, or documentary proof of legal status. Um, so that's what's required at DDS. And if you, so if you're not a citizen, you know, they know that you are here of legal status and they know you're not a citizen and you're not even given the opportunity to opt in uh, or opt out. You're just automatically not, not, um, not even get to that part of the process. Um, so that's how the citizenship is, citizenship check is handled um, for that. The other way it's handled is for people who don't register at DDS. If you register um, on, a, uh, on a paper application through a voter registration drive, for instance, uh, both state and federal law require that you put your driver's license or state ID number on that registration if you have one. When you get it, or when your county receives that form, the first thing it does is it, uh, verify, it types the information into the database you are in what's called pending status until your name, date of birth, uh, driver's license number, and citizenship status are verified through DDS. So it's an overnight process. Every application that comes in um, is, 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 in the, is in, and then you're, you're pending. You go, it's kind of an overnight process where all of it goes to DDS. They run checks off of all the numbers, send the county election officials the data back. If anyone is a non-match for citizenship, there's a citizenship column. It says either Y for yes or N for no. So if you are a non-match for citizenship, you are put in pending status for your voter registration. And you cannot vote uh, in that pending status until you show documentary proof of citizenship that's set out uh, in, our, in our law already um, in 21-2-216. So in the instance that, uh, you brought up if you have a driver's license now that says limited term uh, driver's license and you show it to go vote you will be you will be recognized and you're in the the poll pad uh, which is what the poll worker looks at on election day in pending status i believe you have a um either a purple x or there's something that identifies your record you are not even the poll workers the system does not let the poll worker go forward without resolving that that pending status and the way they resolve it um, is to show a documentary proof of citizenship. The only reason that a person who has a limited term license wouldn't be in that status is if they have because when they when they uh, when their match comes back and it says, "Hey, you're one of citizen," according to DDS, then they get a letter and they have to show documentary proof of citizenship then. Um, so they can go ahead and clear that up before they vote. Many times they do uh, with a certificate of naturalization. And if the county um, election official receives that, if it matches the information with the voter, then they go ahead and, and kind of un uncheck the flag that says U.S. citizen. And they'll say it'll say U.S. citizen, yes, instead of U.S. citizen, no. Um, and so if they have resolved it previously, they could still have a limited term license, but they would have already resolved their um, uh, citizenship issue. Uh, the other thing I would tell the committee is, you know, one of my main jobs is basically defending uh, state laws when they're challenged in court. Our citizenship check law um, is being challenged in court right now. Um, we're currently in litigation about that. Um, I think it's our citizen check, citizenship check law is, is vital to ensure that uh, uh, non-citizens do not accidentally get the opportunity to vote. And I think it's doing a good job with that. Um, but I do want to make sure that we uh, protect protect our law uh, as it is. Uh, our photo ID law was also um, 
at issue in court, um, and that's been resolved in favor of the law was initially struck down and then upheld. Um, I would think that this change uh, to that part of the law would probably reawaken some of some of the litigation about just photo ID for in-person voting in general. In other words, doing this would possibly put in jeopardy the law that we have that requires people to show a photo ID at the polls, or at least reawaken a challenge. It would, it would certain, I, I would, I, I would, it would certainly reawaken a challenge. Okay. And then what about the, um, the litigation regarding our citizen check system? You think putting this into place would it could possibly affect that? I think it could because what what we are uh, our our point in court is our citizenship our citizenship check is vital to ensure that I mean, everyone agrees non citizens shouldn't shouldn't be voting, um, uh, it and um, our check is vital to ensure that doesn't happen. If we put in something else, kind of further down the road, to be another check, it kind of puts the, well, why are you doing this first check if you didn't do another check? So I think, you know, we've kind of got to figure out, okay, how are we going to do this and then do it that way? And the way we're doing it right now is through the citizenship check, that registration um, under 21-2216. Um, and I believe that's a vital, a vital um, thing that needs to be protected. Any questions for Mr. Germany? Um, what number are you, Chairwoman Rich? 11. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mr. Germany, for being here. Despite what I have read on the internet that Representative Byrd and Mr. King have uh, represented about my opinions and beliefs, I very much want to make sure that only citizens are allowed to vote, and I want to make sure that our laws are as strong as possible in that regard. So I want to ask you, because I want to be certain, if we were to pass this law, would it provide any protection in a non-citizen being able to vote? No, it wouldn't. It our, would do nothing. Our, our, our citizenship, citizenship check law um, through, the, through DDS, either at DDS for the registering or through the, through the batch that we do in the nightly batch process is already checking whether or not they are a citizen. And then I want to clarify, I think this might be something that uh, Chairman Martin was was getting at. What would happen if a non-citizen obtained a limited term license and then subsequently became naturalized and presented that photo ID to vote? Would they be allowed to vote? So if they had, if they have, they would have been put in pending status when they registered. Um, they would have gotten a letter saying, hey, you, this didn't match on your app, on your registration. So they could have cleared it up uh, with their county board of elections by showing a naturalization certificate or another approved document that's set out in, in 21-2216. If they have already cleared that up, they would, they would be flagged as a US citizen, basically says yes or no, and it would be yes. So the system would allow them to vote even if it said not a voter ID. Correct, and if they had, let's say they had um, a, uh, this is probably, I don't think it would practically happen in real life, but if they had an, an ID that didn't say limited term, but the voter registration system still had them as pending, if for instance, they hadn't updated their registration, they would have to show documentary proof of citizenship before they're allowed to vote. It's, it's a separate thing than photo ID. Okay, photo and then, ID is, is, is just not the same thing as a citizenship check. Right, and then I have one, one last question. Is there any way in this system that someone can take a limited term license, a non-citizen can take a limited term license, show it at the polls and vote. Not without showing, not without proving to their county beforehand through the documentary proof let out in Georgia law that, that they are a, a US citizen. So their naturalization paperwork. Or there's other paperwork, but generally it's naturalization paperwork that, that is shown. And who is it who reviews the naturalization paperwork? the county election, it's the registrar, the county election registrar. Okay, all right, thank you. Chairman Spire, you, did you wanna ask a question? Go, go follow, ahead, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to follow up with Representative Rich. Do they do that in advance or is that on the spot? You, tell, tell me about that process, I know. Um, you, you, you can do it in advance, you get a, you get a notice if you um, come back as a non-citizen, as, as, as soon as the county gets that non-match, they send the voter a notice saying, hey, here was, 
we got it. You, it came back as a non-match on citizenship. You've got to clear it up. You're going to be in pending status until you clear it up. So we certainly recommend you clearing it up as soon as possible. Um, but but it can be cleared up uh, on the spot uh, it, as long as you have the proper paperwork uh, when you show up to vote. Speaker Pro Tem Jones, your number is 11. Go ahead. You now third. Hold on one second. Yeah, pull that. Um, <clears throat> in addition to the question that Representative Rich asked, so I, I understand your response that if you show up to vote, that you stated uh, if you're a non citizen, that you would not be allowed to cast a vote at, at, at the polls. Is it possible, though, for a non citizen? Um, to accidentally be registered to vote, say at the county level, if they go to their county board of registration to register to vote? I, mean, I wouldn't say it's impossible mm -hmm. um, because you know humans are running these systems and, and, and things can happen. Um, but I would say that we have, I think in our law, um, a strong check uh, against that, probably the strongest that, uh, that we could possibly have. Um, and so it's certainly not possible, uh, or uh, I, sh I shouldn't say that, but the least likely scenario for that to happen is when, um, is when we're dealing with DDS either through an automatic, either, either through the opt-in voter registration at DDS or when we're matching a, a, a driver's license number. So, so that's, I think that's the safest okay. um, way that we have. So DDS is the safest to prevent the accidental registration yes. of a non-citizen. Yes, I believe so. At the county board of election level, would a driver's license with the wording that's been proposed, would that add security so that, or, or is it is the failure in the person not checking the driver's license number, what, what would, What's the best security that we have at, I guess that's what I'm asking, at the county level? The, the best security, so at DDS, because DDS is only issuing uh, real ID compliant IDs um, at this point, I think they've only been issuing that since 2012. Mm -hmm. um, so while there's still a few people who don't have one yet, right. you know, that they're, they have, they, their renewals haven't cycled um, yet, but I think it's very, very few who don't have a real ID compliant mm -hmm. ID. So. Um, that means that when, when they're checking their status at DDS, when you're checking either citizen or, you know, legal resident, um, because non-legal residents cannot get driver's licenses or IDs in Georgia, um, you're checking it based off of documents that the, per, that the person at DDS has in front of them. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for me, I think I had to bring a passport and a birth certificate. You have to bring documents to prove yeah. that I'm a citizen. Um, and that's the same thing. They have to prove that they are a legal resident when they get that. Um, so the safest are the people that are actually at DDS. Um, and uh, we do have a, a system in place that ensures for the people that are non-citizens, they are not registered as part of motor voter. Um, if they try to register later, like for instance, if someone comes to their door and says, oh, you can register and they might not know, our law requires that you put your driver's license number uh, down on that registration and the, the drivers, the road registration form says that if you have one, this is required to put that down. Um, we, we, there's regulations that require third party groups to tell people they're registering. If you have a driver's license, you are required to put it here. Um, so that's the next best because we, we run that number mm. off of DDS's database and we'll get, uh, we'll get back what, what matches and what doesn't. Um, and if it's a no for citizenship, they're in pending status until um, until it's uh, cleared up. So the driver follow-up question, Mr. Chairman. Yes. So the driver's license number is the second best. If they don't have a driver's license and they're not a citizen, what's the? I mean, what what security do we have? Of course, the, this wouldn't address that because uh, they would. Th this bill license. wouldn't address that at all. Um, 
right now, the way that that, that, that happens is you're checked. Uh, you have to check that you don't have a driver's license and you put your social security number down uh, or the last four of your social. And then that number is matched off of um, the social security administration database. Um, and it matches uh, first name, last name, date of birth, and last four social. Um, and, it, and, and so that's, that's how that process works. So I guess follow up, if you're not a citizen, you wouldn't have a social security number. Uh, I believe it's possible to have a social if you're not Is a it? citizen, but it's, but it's not, it's not um, a typical occurrence by any means. And then one, Mr. Chairman, I have one separate question because I just thought about this. Is it possible, because we, we, we've grappled with this some, is it possible for a, I'll see here, does Georgia have the authority through state legislation to implement motor voter opt-in voter registration as opposed to our current opt-out? And the reason I'm asking is I've been here a long time and I don't remember us passing legislation for opt-out, but then I hear that's what we have. So the, the way that that came about is um, Department of Driver Services uh, received a uh, received a threat, basically a litigation threat about how we were we were doing motor voter, how Georgia was doing motor voter. Working with the Attorney General's office, they determined that the current system is what they had to do to comply with the federal motor voter law. Um, so, you know, that's really probably a better question for the Attorney General's office as to whether or not um, I know at that at that point they determined that we had to do uh the the op the opt-out process probably don't have that authority or that we might be in violation of federal law i mean that that was the concern that the attorney general's office reached as to as to why the system is the way it is um i really couldn't say okay uh, um um I, I think. So we might ask the attorney general ask for an opinion. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you being with us today. Thank you. Mr. All right. Permission to be recognized for two minutes, please. Well, we've got several people that have signed up, and at the end, if uh, depends on how the other testimony goes, I'll consider that. But not not right now. We're going to go to some other people. All right. Um, we have Miss uh, Miss Leslie with Department of Driver Services, who has signed up, and I think you're with us via Zoom, Ms. Leslie. Can you hear me? I can. Good afternoon, Chair and the committee. Can you guys hear me? Oh, uh, be helpful if the chair would push the right buttons. All right, Ms. Leslie, can you hear me now? I can. Can you guys hear me? Yes, and we can okay. see you also. Welcome. Awesome. Uh, please um, introduce yourself, tell us who you're with, and we'd be happy to hear from you. Okay, good afternoon, Chairman and committee. Uh, my name is Shavonda Leslie, and I serve as the Director of Governmental Affairs and Communication for the Georgia Department of Driver Services. So I want to kind of go over what we do in our uh, centers once we get a team, uh, someone to come in, a customer to come in. So when a team member gets a customer to come in, um, of course, there are several system checks that, that we have in place um, to verify that someone is a citizen, and if they are a non-citizen, whether or not they are lawfully present. Um, before, once you have proved that you are a citizen, you're good to go. But if you if you prove to be a non-citizen before we even, once we prove that you're a non-citizen, whether you give us a documentation or you tell us that you're a, a non-citizen, um, our team members never even get to the next screen to do voter inf registration information because we don't actually register people to vote. We provide that information to Secretary of State's office um, to do the registration piece along with the county. Um, so at that point, um, we take that information that, from the documentation that the customers bring to us and we then run that information through SAVE. So it's just not SAVE. Um, we don't just do SAVE and we don't just do the document for verification. We do a cross between the two um, of save and the document to confirm that this is a legitimate document and yes the federal government is aware that you are here and that you are lawfully present um a point that did come up about other states this is the distinction between georgia dds and other states is that we do not issue non 
real ID co compliant cards, non-compliant cards. We only issue real ID compliant cards, which means of course we vetted your information. And I think back in 2012, there was a lot of complaints um, about people. And we still have complaints about people having to come in and bring their identification, their uh, identifying information documents, such as your birth certificate um, and social security card passport and naturalization document or immigration documentation um, to prove that you are lawfully present. So we have many checks and balances in place. Um, and I think that distinguishes Georgia from a lot of uh, other state, many other states. Um, we, are, uh, we are one of the leaders in Real ID compliant cards. We have about 99, 98.9% uh, of our um, citizens have been issued Real ID compliant cards. As um, Mr. Jeremy stated, there are a few people that still have outstanding cards and that's only because they have not come to their renewal date. As Mr. King stated, once he would have come in for his renewal, he would have had brought those documentation in to prove that he is who he said he is and that he is lawfully present. Okay, we um, appreciate you. Um, any questions for Ms. Leslie? Uh, Speaker Pro Tem Jones is number 12, is that right? Yes, sir. Or 13. 13. 13. Yes, uh, thank you uh, for your comments. So you mentioned a very high percentage of Georgia residents that are uh, legal citizens with driver's licenses have real ID. Is that because my recollec recollection is that we passed a 10, 10 year renewal some time ago and if it's been since 12 that we've had um, real ID that as we approach the year 22, that most likely every person will have a real ID if they've had that 10 year period. Is that why we're almost there? Yes, yes, ma'am. It's actually eight years now, but at one oh, point, I believe, I believe it was, it may have been, but prior to me coming on board, it may have been 10 years. Okay. However, um, it is eight years now. But yes, as the, as people began to phase out as far as renewal cycles, um, we began to then give them their issue their their credential. Again, we do not issue non real ID cards, so you would have to come in with a car, with identification um, such as your birth certificate, passports, and the social security card um, in order to be provided with a real ID credential. And then just because I really am mm -hmm. somewhat ignorant on some of these issues. If you're a non-citizen, you would not have a real ID. You will have the, you will have a real ID card, yeah. but it would have the limited term because you still have to bring in that documentation. The only way we know that you are a non-citizen, outside of you just saying that you're not a non-citizen, okay. we would need to have that documentation. So if you don't have a birth a, a U.S. birth certificate, then we know that you don't have it, or or there may be some other things going on with you, but we need to be able to prove that documentation. So yes, we, you, we, there, everybody gets a real ID card. So real ID just means verified, double check. Everybody had to go through all those documents and having them verified. Correct, and for non-citizens, they have a another step in that we have to verify that non-citizen, that uh, lawfully present documentation just to confirm that the federal government does have this same documentation and that you are lawfully present and they know that you are here and when um, that, that term should expire for that credential. Ms. Leslie, did you say that we print something called limited term on dri some driver's licenses now? The limited term is for the non-citizens that are lawfully present. So, so that where is, where is it? Is it where is limited term put on the driver's license? It's on the top in the center of the, the license. Okay. And and it indicates non citizenship status. That's what that limited term means that 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 you are not a citizen. We only give that to non citizens that are lawfully present. Okay. All right. Uh, Chairman Smyre. Let, let me ask you a question. If, if, if a person comes in at, at say as a citizen and they, they pre present those three uh, for the birth certificate, um, passport, and some legal ID, they, they issued a, a, a license, driver's license. Yes, sir. On the spot. Now, if, 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 if it's the non-sentence, 
non-citizen, when do you when do you when do you quantify and and classify them as non-citizens? And 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 what what is your collaboration with the, with the federal government? Walk me through that process. When I, if, it's you, neat. if you declare somebody as a non-citizen, mm -hmm. then how do you collaborate with the federal authorities? How, tell me how y'all do that. It's immediate, just as you and I go in there and get our, our license, just right then and there. Well, we don't get actual, the actual car, but we get a paper temporary license. It's immediate. So when you bring in your documentation and you tell us or you provide us with documentation that shows that you are a non-citizen, we then take that documentation the federal government gives you to prove to say that you are lawfully present. We take that document, the information from that documentation, and we enter it into the SAVE database. The, then the SAVE database will then send us back, return us information to say, yes, this person um, immigration status or naturalized, naturalized or derived is citizenship is confirmed. Um, and so if you are not confirmed, say there's a system out as, um, as far as on the federal government side, if there's some type of problem, if there's some no type, the document doesn't match what the federal government sends back, then you are not issued a, a credential. It, one follow, Mr. Chairman. Go, it, go ahead. On the limited term, it's at the top. Is the one that represented the birds? Is this one showed us? That's the. Is that the only? That that's what that that qualifies it as as non non citizen when it says limited term driver's license and it's not a voter ID. Is that? That is correct. Okay. Okay. Chairwoman Rich, did you have a question number eleven? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yes. Yes, thank you. And I, I think that in answering Dean Smyrie, you may have answered my question. One issue that of concern that has been brought to me, um, people are worried that the clerks who work in the Department of Driver Services are determining what is proper identification for citizenship. Can you tell me how that process works when an individual presents their documentation that proves their citizenship, whether it's naturalization papers or a birth certificate? Is it the clerk who determines whether that is sufficient? No, ma'am. So there's a list of documents that's acceptable um, from that receipt that we receive from the federal government. Well, the customer receives from the federal government. Um, so, and it's just not the documentation alone. So the documentation in combination with the SAVE uh, database. So that documentation, if it's a document that's ne not recognized by the SAVE database, by the SAVE um, federal government, then we would not accept that. If it's a documentation that is not valid um, and it comes back that this is not acceptable, we will not accept that. So, so DDS is a digital file clerk of sorts and uploads the documentation that is provided by the customer? We, we enter that information. Um, there's this, and, and I don't know all the, I know one of them is like an I-9. I don't know all the, ident the identifying numbers or serial um, acronyms for each partic uh, particular um, notice uh, documentation. However, that we take that information from that documentation and we then enter that information into the SAVE database. Okay, so, and then SAVE, save will, either, will, will match it or not match it. That's correct. Well, okay. it, sometimes it may take longer. But so it may, you know, sometimes it's not as immediate as you and I. So if it takes a, an hour or a couple of days, usually for the most part, it's rather quickly. But if there's some type of problem, then we will not issue until we have a clearance from SAVE. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any further questions for Ms. Leslie? All right, Ms. Leslie, thank you so much for taking the time. Can you hang around just in case with any I, other questions? I questions sure will. Up? I okay. sure will. On a Friday afternoon, you'll do that for us. I sure will. Well, we, appre we appreciate it. Reverend Smyre has been looking at me for, uh, Chairman Smyre has been looking at me for a little bit right now. Like, he, he, it's Friday afternoon. I'm kidding. I, he, he's not. I'm, I'm kidding with him. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Hold on one second. All right. Um, Representative Byrd. Can you come up, please, ma'am? Mm -hmm. um, the chair, one of the chair's main goals in this whole process of anything that we do with our election law Agreed. is to make sure that whatever we do, 
we don't jeopardize the good things in the system we have. Pull the mic down a little bit. Yeah, we don't jeopardize the 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 good things in we system that we have by anything that we do. Um, and as was mentioned today, our current ID check, which has been described, uh, is under attack. Uh, and we want to make sure anything that we do doesn't help that attack because I want that system to stay strong. Um, now, you're in an, a, a difficult position because my question is a legal question, which I don't think that um, I wouldn't ask you to answer it. I'm an attorney. I cannot answer sitting here now the question of whether or not um, moving your legislation forward would actually, to put it oversimplified, it would do more harm than good mm -hmm. uh, in the cause that we're all trying to go behind. But I did want to give you a chance to respond to that if you want to, but the chair is going to give you an assignment is to go see if you can find an answer to that question because I don't know that we want to move ahead until we do that. Does that make sense? Absolutely makes sense indeed. And okay. I appreciate that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you for being here today. Of course. It is 430. We did have other people signed up to testify, but the chair is going to halt at this point uh, and because we have reached some good questions uh, that I think need to be answered before we do any further consideration. So I appreciate everybody's uh, being here today, and I hope that you have a safe trip home and that you have a good Friday. Thank you. We stand adjourned.